welcome to our time of worship this morning. Truly, this is the day the Lord has made, and it's a beautiful spring today. Welcome to spring. Spring is from. So please join me now as we pray a prayer of praise and adoration for our time of worship this morning. Let us pray. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father God, thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for the beauty of this day, Lord. Thank you for the beauty that you allowed one day in seven to be set aside to worship and honor you. And so now, Lord, as we come together with the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide and direct our worship, we will sing songs of praise, we will pray, we will preach. Yes, Lord, we will fellowship, and we will give you all the glory and honor for the next hour. Calm our hearts, Lord. Open our minds. Leave all the baggage of the cares and concerns of the world at the front door. Now quiet our hearts, Lord, as we give you all the glory and honor through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. This time I call Denise for our morning announcements and our call to worship. welcome you to Northminster Presbyterian Church this morning. We're glad you're with us worshiping either here in person or at home. Um, we ask and we hope and we pray that today's uh, uh, sermon and worship service will be a blessing to you. Uh, I have just a few announcements. First of all, we do welcome back Dr. Greg Seltzer. We're so glad he's here with us this morning. Um, there's some information about Dr. Seltzer in the bulletin if you'd like to look at that. Um, and next week, following the worship service, there'll be a brief congregational meeting after worship to adopt a revised budget. So we ask that you uh, be here next week if you can and stay after as we go over the budget. I think Barry has an announcement this morning. Mm -hmm. Um, I just I, I can just do it here. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, uh, please be patient with us, those of you who are looking to find uh, the content of the worship service online. Mm -hmm. So, uh, had some struggles over the last month, balance issues with volume and so forth. Um, a couple weeks that just didn't exist because some weird thing happened where there was an electronic noise over the entire uh, uh, recording. So right now, the recording is not live. So those, obviously, you're here, so <laughs> you're not looking for it to be live. But um, for those of you who want to go back and watch it, if you will simply go to our uh, YouTube page, you don't have to have Facebook for this, all you have to do is have an internet connection. Go to the YouTube page and you can look it up very simply. It's called Northminster Church, Northminster Presbyterian Church of Pensacola. Uh, if you Google or, or uh, type that into YouTube, it'll come right up. If you click on subscribe, then you'll be notified every time a new video is uploaded. Um, we're also supposed to be sending out the emails usually within 24 hours after the service, but apparently some of you are not getting that email. So just go to YouTube, subscribe, and you'll be, you'll be set. So thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, if you will please join me in the call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 51. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. The sacrifice acceptable, acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. Friends, let us worship God. Please kind of hear it before our opening hymn, O oh Jesus, I have promised.
Come to that time in our worship that we must approach the throne of grace with clean hands and a pure heart. And so we must take an, take an opportunity to confess our trespasses and our transgressions to our Heavenly Father. And so please join me now at this time as we pray a prayer of confession. And then in the silence of our hearts, fess up to our Heavenly Father. Let us pray. O oh God of forgiveness, you tell us through your Apostle John that he or she that is without sin is a liar, and the truth is not within them. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, now we do that. We come before you hanging our hats on that promise, Lord, that yes, your word is true. Your word is true. Your word is true. And so, Lord, now in the silence of our hearts, please let us take and confess our sins before you. brothers in the Lord, hear the good news. Since we have boldly gone before that throne of grace, and we have confessed those sins, they are as far as the east is from the west. They have been cast into the depths of the sea. They are no longer seen by our Heavenly Father, because they are seen through the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so, celebrate the fact that you and I are forgiven people to the glory of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah, uh, one of the major Old Testament prophets. Jeremiah is writing in the 6th century. You may be familiar with Jeremiah. He's sometimes called the weeping prophet. And that's because there's a lot of lament in what Jeremiah writes. Jeremiah went into captivity uh, when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem in 586 B.C. The northern kingdom, Israel, had been captured about 130 years earlier by the Assyrian Empire. And now the successor kingdom was the Babylonians. And their capital was in what's modern-day Iraq, about 600 miles from Jerusalem. And so these people were deported to Babylon, where they would spend 70 years in captivity. God had to bring judgment upon them for their false worship. However, God is a gracious God. God is a restorative God. And God talks to the prophet Jeremiah and says, I will bring these people back. I will restore them. I will refresh them. And once again, they will be my people. I will give them a new heart. And so here now are the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. 
These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time in our worship, please stand if you're able and let us affirm what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a book that uh, we do not know who the author of Hebrews is. There's many theories. Uh, some say Paul, some say Apollos. Uh, however, uh, the syntax, the writing, is not like Paul's other letters. And so the author does not identify himself in the, as the author of Hebrews. However, Hebrews was written, it was primarily addressed to Jewish converts who were familiar with the Old Testament. And they were being tempted to revert to Judaism and, and, and to Judaize the gospel, in effect, to let the law creep back in and let grace take a, a backseat. The theme of Hebrews, when you read Hebrews, is the absolute supremacy of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is now our high priest. We no longer need to go into the temple. We no longer need to take and offer sacrifices of animals, the blood of bulls and goats, sheep, none of that anymore. Jesus Christ is the final sacrifice. And he says in this that he's basically superior to all the Old Testament prophets, whether it be Moses or, or Aaron. And of course the priesthood passed through Aaron through that order of what he speaks about here is the order of Melchizedek, the Arianic high priesthood. So please listen now for the word of God. Hebrews chapter 5, we're reading verses 5 through 10. Hear now the words of the Lord. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Continuing now with our gospel reading, appointed for the lectionary this week, this is the Sunday in Lent, is John's gospel. We considered John's gospel last week, and now we're considering it also again, John, John chapter 12. We're dealing with the events in the last week of our Lord's life. By way of background, we're somewhat reversed here because the events that I'm going to be reading about in a moment take place after Jesus' triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. So as you know, next week is Palm Sunday. So these events here are taking place in that afternoon or evening of that Palm Sunday, that Palm Sunday of Holy Week. So John is speaking here now. Hear now the words of the Lord. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, for where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice from heaven said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me now as I pray a prayer of illumination for the hearing of God's word and the preaching of it. Let us pray. O oh Lord, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God. May I rightly divide your word of truth, and may that word of truth be edifying to our minds, but most of all, convicting to our hearts. May it bring glory and honor not to me, but to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I heard a story a while back about a, a young person who wanted to have perfect attendance in Sunday school. He was going on vacation and he was somewhat worried, how could he take and have perfect vacation, perfect Sunday school attendance on that vacation? And so he asked a Sunday school teacher and she said to him, well, just bring back a bulletin from the service of a church that you visit and I'll give you credit for perfect attendance. So sure enough, the boy went to at church while on vacation with his parents. Well, while they were entering the church, they were standing out on the narthex, and one of the ushers was passing out the bulletins, and the little boy looked around, and he saw a large brass plaque on the wall. And he said to the usher, what's that all about? And the usher said, well, little boy, that's all the people who died in the service. And with that, the boy ran out of the church screaming. I don't want to be there. Yeah. The service. Well, praise God for those men and women who had the ultimate sacrifice for our freedoms. However, as a play on words there, you think about service. Prayerfully, none of us are going to die in this service. But that's a little bit funny. You think about the word service. Think about the word service. Well, this sermon topic for this morning is called dying to live. That's also a play on words if you think about it. How can a person die in order to live? It sounds oxymoronic. As a matter of fact, it even sounds counterintuitive. How do you die to live? Well, as I said in the introduction to our gospel reading of John, this, this teaching was for Jesus, these Greeks. And we might also insert a parenthesis there, Greeks, they were, they were Gentiles, okay, and they wished to see Jesus. And as I said, these events took place on Palm Sunday sometime in the afternoon or evening of Holy Week, immediately after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now remember, Jesus is in Jerusalem for Passover. And we find these Greeks also in Jerusalem which will not surprise anyone when you think about it, because there were many people throughout the Greek and Roman Empire who were known as proselytes. They were Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. And you might also know that Passover was one of the three pilgrimage festivals that all Jewish males were required to make once a year to Jerusalem. The others were being Shabbat and Sukkot. They're described in the Hebrew Bible. And according to the Torah, God commanded the Israelites, three times a year your men shall appear before the Lord your God in the place 
that God will choose, in this case, the temple in Jerusalem. On the festival of Passover, this is what we're speaking about in John's reading, the other one was Shavuot, which was the Feast of Weeks, and then, of course, there was Sukkot, which was the Festival of Booths. They shall not appear empty-handed. Each shall bring his own gift, a blessing, of which the Lord your God has given you. And we see this taking place previously when people were in the temple courts buying and selling animals that they needed for the temple sacrifice. So possibly some historians believe that the, the population of Jerusalem may have swelled to somewhere between two and three million people three times a year for these festivals. And so you can see it's a very large crowd in Jerusalem. And of course, Passover was one of the most important festivals. It celebrated the release of the Jewish children when they were captives in, in Egypt. And so these Greek-speaking Gentiles first come to Philip, which is also a Greek-sounding name. The request was very simple. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. In the pulpit of the former church I was pastor of, inscribed in that pulpit was those words, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. That church was 120 years old, and each pastor who had served that church over those preceding years had carved his initials right underneath that saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. I found it unique, and I found it also kind of a, a privilege, but also I thought I was desecrating that pulpit, but sure enough, I carved my initials in there. Because every time a person stands in the pulpit, whoever that man or woman is, hopefully you're going to see Jesus before this hour is over. So these Greeks are coming, and they wish to see Jesus too. Okay, they're simple, but why Jesus? I mean, why Jesus? Well, perhaps it was his celebrity status, if you think about it. He just rode into Jerusalem that morning. The exultant crowd were waving palm branches. They're shouting hosannas. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who is this guy? He's a rock star, so to speak. Or perhaps they heard of his fame when he raised a man named Lazarus from the dead just a week before who had been dead for four days. Whatever the reason, Jesus was famous or infamous, depending on, on your viewpoint. And so Philip takes him to Andrew, who takes him to Jesus, and this would be no surprise because Andrew has always taken people to see Jesus. He was the first disciple that Jesus called to his brother, then Simon Peter, and then, of course, the Messiah. He said, we found him and brought Jesus to him. So now Jesus teaches this amazing paradox that many, many Bible scholars and the theologians have struggled over. How can a person live in order to die? Think about that. Yes, dying to live. What is the meaning of that, dying to live? Well, I guess it's that time in the sermon now where I've got to tell you the facts of life. <laughs> I'm not speaking about that conversation you may have had with your mother or father many years ago when you were entering puberty, that proverbial talk about the birds and the bees. No, I'm going to tell you another fact of life or death. And that is death is one for one. There is no escaping death, short of the second coming or return of our Lord. Only two men in the Bible, when we read our Bibles, only two men in the Bible ever escaped tasting death and were carried into heaven without dying, of course, and that was Enoch and Elijah. But death is one for one. There's no escaping it. Now, you might have been born with good genes, okay? You might have been born with good genes. I think I was born with good genes. My father lived to be 93, and my mother, who just passed away last September, was 96. So maybe I can hang my hat on good genes, but not necessarily. My mother, as I said, just died in 96, and she says, I don't know if I should renew my driver's license or not. <laughs> and then I said to her, well, I said, Mother, I said, you know, I'm going to get you one of those things. It's called Life Alert. You know, you put it around you, and you can you, you hit it in case something happens, and help is on the way. And she goes, no thanks, son. She goes, that's for old people. <laughs> well, there's no guarantees in life, but she was looking forward to the future anyway. We might eat healthy food, okay? Or we might, uh, not, we might not smoke. Or we might take our vitamins every day. Or our prescription medications. We might exercise regularly. We might get annual medical checkups and health screenings. We might try to mask our aging with cosmetic surgery or hair transplants. But in reality, 
finally, all we are doing is postponing the inevitable. And yes, our lives, if you think about it, in the span of time, they're oh so short. You may have been like me as a child. I could not wait to grow up. I couldn't wait till Santa Claus came every Christmas, or I could get my driver's license, or I could get graduate from high school, or get married, or start a family. But one day I woke up and I looked in the mirror and I saw the face of my father. My old man. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, whoa. And now Christmas comes so fast each year, I can't believe it was three months ago. <laughs> and it'll, it'll be here again before we know it. And just like that, my birthdays seem to be coming faster and faster. And I cannot believe that in two years, just thinking about this, in two years, I will be married to the same woman for 50 years. God bless her. <laughs> Pray for her. <laughs> but not to mention, a few years back, I became a grandfather. How did it happen? You know, Einstein, Albert Einstein, uh, the father of special relativity, told us that time is relative. Yeah, I agree, it's relatively short. But the Bible speaks in many cases about the brevity of life. James talks about, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a midst that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Psalm 144, man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Proverbs 27, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. Psalm 90, so teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And wow, 1 Peter 1 24, for all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fails, and there are no more. These flowers here will not live much longer. You know, they've been cut. They've been cut off. They've been cut down. They will die just as each and every one of us will. Death is the sentence that's pronounced on each and every one of us, all upon all of humanity, because of the original sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve. And this should really cause us reflection, because during Lent, which we begin on Ash Wednesday, how many people may have had ashes in the sign of a cross placed on your forehead to symbolize what that pastor says? And I thought about that every time I put those ashes on people's foreheads. Dust you are, and to dust you shall return. But I believe you get the point. This is not a morbid sermon, although it started out that way. But it's an important teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus is speaking of being glorified, he means by no uncertain means that he's talking about his pending death on the cross, his crucifixion. But rather than looking for a conquering king in, in the mold of King David, Jesus talks about the conquest of life over death in his sacrifice to pay for our sins. And so, yes, you and I can die each day, not physically, I just spoke about that, but we can die spiritually. We can die to the things of the world, as Jesus is speaking about. His obedience was a part of the foreordained plan of God, and Jesus was submissive. He carried it out, that plan. But the eternal life comes at a cost, and in order for us to live, we must die. Well, what are some of the questions we must consider? Well, Jesus is talking about bearing fruit. It's a very simple metaphor. You can't bear fruit unless you put the seed in the ground. The seed must die, in effect, and be buried in order for it to sprout and grow. Jesus says the same thing. We must die to this world in order for us to bear fruit. And what is he speaking about? How can us, the community, called the church bear fruit? And how can we as individual believers bear fruit? Now, the Reformed theological tradition talks about, about sin being, being the deprivation of the good, but it can also involve the exploitation of the good. In this understanding, sin entails an exposure of what we take essentially good and sometimes make something bad out of it. Think about that. If you think it, the lectionary in this text this morning talks about this metaphor of Jesus' imminent death, and he's speaking about something in the food chain. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground 
into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The statement has an intriguing qualification. If it dies, and dying is necessary in order to produce fruit. Soil was fragile and its nutrients could easily be depleted. But here it is, this dying seed metaphor that Jesus is talking about is us crucifying the passions, the things of this world that we've just got to have, we've got to hang on to. For Jesus said hating one's life would entail self-rejection, absorption, exploitation. These are the things of the world. And when the world is used here, it's that word somewhat I spoke about last week. The word cosmos meant the entire world. This world that he's speaking about here is the Greek word cosmon. It means the things that we grasp for, the things that are under control of this world, the things we've got to have, whether it be consumerism or exploitiveness or greed or selfishness. And the fruitful and abundant life to which Jesus is speaking about is a life of loving service to others. It's giving rather than getting, taking rather than grabbing, if you will. It yields to others. It does not insist on its own way. And the fruitful life, the fruitful life of a Christian does not look at things and say, what's in it for me? Now, resisting exploitation can be rather costly if you think about it. But living in fullness for others, or to paraphrase the words of John's Gospel in the prologue, the light will shine in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. But what does the fruitful life produce? Well, the fruitful life produces those things that we considered last week. Paramount is love. But then, of course, there's joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and gentleness, faithfulness, and yes, self-control. You know, Jesus taught that in one of his great I Am teachings. You know the I Am teachings. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Cut off from me. You can do nothing. So he's the source. He's the source. Cut off from him. We can do nothing. This is what it means to take up our cross daily and follow him. If you think about it, it's part of being born again. It's part of dying in order to live. Trying to hang on to our earthly lives means we lose our lives in the eternal kingdom. And we don't glorify God by accumulating possessions. The questions become that we must answer ourselves. Do we own our things or do our things own us? Is it not liberating when we have an old fashioned spring clean out? You know? Especially clothes closets. <laughs> or how about limiting all that stuff we have in the garage so that we might actually be able to park a car in it? <laughs> or just go out here on Nine Mile Road and with the storage buildings that you can rent because we have too much stuff for the houses to hold. Now, please don't get me wrong. It is not a sin to have a nice home and nice car. But do they possess us? The question becomes how much is enough? My friends, during the course of my ministry, I have conducted many services at a graveside. I have ridden to the cemetery in the hearse. Oh, no, no, it's the funeral coach now. But I've ridden in that hearse with the funeral director. And in all my years of ministry, and in all those services on the way to the cemetery, I have yet to see that hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. <laughs> I don't know. As a faith community, though, called the church, think about it. We should define our purpose in Christ's death and resurrection. The fruit that is produced is his, is his death and his love for the world. Yes, that's what's going to secure us eternal life. Okay? We have been raised from death to life. How have we been raised from death to life? Because we are all now dead in our sins. Until that time that each of us, you and I, made a profession of faith in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And when you did that, you were signed, sealed, not yet delivered, but signed and sealed for all of eternity. And that's the beauty of it. The eternal security of a believer. That nothing can separate us, as I spoke about last week, from the love of God. Not even death, if you think about it. 
He gives us our marching orders in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you know, don't store for yourself treasures on, on, on earth where moth and rust consume, and thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And then you think about the disciples in Matthew chapter 25. When he's giving them a teaching there, it's called the Olivet Discourse because he's on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. And he says to his disciples, go and do this. And they say to him, Lord, when did we see you sick and hungry and naked and thirsty and in prison and minister to you? And you know what he said? If you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. That's what dying to live means. It means putting off the old self, producing the fruits of righteousness. Paul talked about that in Galatians 6, 22. Gentleness, self-control, peace, joy, love. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, we need to be guided by the Spirit. Yeah, the kingdom came, but it's not yet here complete. He inaugurated this kingdom with his life and death and resurrection and ascension 2,000 years ago. But it's not finished. It's a continuing work project that myself and each one of you are called to joyfully enter into as disciples of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. It's a joyful thing to think about. That less is more because we have eternity ahead of us. Eternity ahead of us. Friends, do you see what Jesus... Do you see Jesus like those Greeks saw him? If so, you gotta look up. You gotta look up to the cross of Calvary, the costly thing. That's the grand reversal. That's the grand reversal. Yes, Jesus is here. He said, the hour has come. The hour has come for us, the body of Christ on earth, the church, the disciples of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, to lift him up and to lift others up with him. I want to conclude with a, with a personal story. When I turned 50, age 50, I had an epiphany, a revelation, an awakening, if you will, in my own life. I began to think long and hard and realize I'm probably not going to live 50 more years. Maybe I might, but then again, there's no guarantees. And then I thought to myself, is this all there is? You know, I could have sung that Frank Sinatra song, you know, but I didn't feel like, you know, is that all there is? Is this all there is? No, my friends, this is not all there is. This is not all there is. Because I tell you, if you come see me, if I pass away, and you see me laying in that box and visit, okay, I won't be there. I won't be there. But I'll have a fork in my hand. I'll have a fork in my hand. Because my grandmother always said, after the Sunday dinner was over, hold on to your forks, because the best is yet to come. <laughs> so I'll be laying there with a fork. No, seriously, though. I realized then, after that 50th birthday, that, you know, I need to be living my life for eternity. And so my morning prayer is to wake up and I say, Lord, make me an instrument of your grace today. Where can I take? and so acts of love and kindness and mercy. How can I advance your kingdom? How can I leave this world better than I found it? Because in the end, that's all that's gonna matter. Was I a faithful disciple? Not all the things I could accumulate that I'm not gonna take with me. I realized that then, I was not gonna live 50 more years. Who knows how long we live? Paul said it best in, in, in 2 Timothy 4. He said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. And I like the way the author of Hebrews puts it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I believe those cloud of witnesses are those of our loved ones who have gone on before us, and they are urging us on to the finish line. They're saying, yes, at a boy, at a girl, run the race with endurance, run the race. Because the Christ is the upward call of Jesus Christ himself. Looking, as the author of Hebrews says, to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, what a glorious day that will be. I don't know whether 
we, I have one day to live, or 10 years to live, or 20 more years to live. But what I do know is Jesus said, yes, the hour has come. The time has now. The time has come, friends, to die in order to live. In order to live here and now, we must die not just today, but each and every day. Then truly we will be dying to live. To God be the glory. Amen. <clears throat> this time in our worship service, we will bring forth our tithes and offerings. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Let us celebrate by bringing him our morning gifts. Everyone can pray. 
And the good thing about God is that uh, there's no answering machine in heaven. You don't need to text message him. God always listens and hears our prayers. His ears are always ever open to the cry of the afflicted. And so now we have a list here of joys and concerns on our prayer list. Are there others that need to be added to that list? And of course, as I say, names to be taken away from that list also. If not, then let us go to our Heavenly Father and pray intercessory to others. Let us pray. Well, what a joy it is to take and be able to speak to you. Your ears are always ever open to the cry of the afflicted. And the beautiful thing is, is that scripture tells us that you hold us in the palm of your hands. Our very names are inscribed upon the palms of your hands. You know each and every one of us. What a wonderful personal relation. That's why we can cry out to you, our Heavenly Father, as children. Children in need and children in want. And yes, Lord, we lift up these individuals here that are on our prayer list this morning. You know their needs, Lord. You know their needs. But we pray, Lord, that you will take and guide the hands of, of, the, of the doctors and nurses and, and health technicians and therapists and the people that make these miraculous wonder drugs and prescriptions and things, Lord. For you are the great physician. They are merely your hands, the tools that you take and use to bring about great things. And so we pray a prayer of blessing and also peace comfort and mercy on those who are afflicted, Lord. We celebrate joys also, Lord, and we thank you that you can bring joy into our hearts. A new day, a new opportunity, one more day to praise and glorify you. Lord, we pray for those of our fellowship who are away. We ask that you surround them with a hedge of your protection, Lord. We pray there will be one day a time when people can be back in worship all together, once again, and doing, as I said last week, the things that we're prevented from doing, whether it be simply shaking hands or even seeing a smile, and that smile is not behind a mask. And so now, Lord, we lift up each and every one of them. You know the needs of us. You know those who weren't even mentioned here or listed this morning. We lift them up to you, Lord, and pray to you for your healing, comfort, and grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Continuing our worship now, we say what we believe. In addition to our Apostles' Creed, we conclude with our Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, please stand if you're able for our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
Friends, receive now the benediction. To him who was able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy, be the only wise God with glory and dominion, power and majesty, both now and forevermore. And may that same God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his favor upon you and grant you his everlasting peace this day forth and forevermore. Amen. Amen.